Daniel Jurgen's work has earned him a Pulitzer Prize, United States Energy Award for Lifelong Achievement, and many, many friends here in Houston. Thank you so much, John, and thank you very much for that uh, very nice welcome. I am really happy to be here. It's great to be here in Houston. It's great to be at the uh, World Affairs Council. Indeed, it's very uh, meaningful for me to be here. As you know, many of you in the audience are many friends here and have a deep engagement uh, with this community. Sometimes feel Houston is my home away from home. And it's in this very hotel that we have our Sierra Week conference every year uh, in March. So it does really feel like home away from home. Uh, it's especially meaningful to speak to the World Affairs Council of Houston. Uh, 7,000 members, great organization. I know your chairman couldn't be here, uh, Chip Ray, but John Bretz, thank you very much. And uh, I'm always just very impressed by this organization, the impact it has, uh, and the way it brings this community together to deal with issues that affect world affairs in one way or the other, and reflect the fact that Houston is a great city in Texas, of course, but it's also a great international city. And certainly much credit to Linda West, uh, who's the, the marvelous uh, executive director of this and really runs this council so uh, effectively. But there are three big questions that dominate what I'm writing about. One is, call it the question of scarcity or not. We have, and it maybe isn't even scarcity, we have a, a world today of $65 trillion global economy. 20 years, roughly, give or take, it probably could be as much as $130 trillion. Where is the energy going to come from? How is that energy going to be supplied? It's a huge job. Many of you in this room are engaged and doing your part to answer that question, but it's a big challenge. The second is the question of security, uh, energy security, which is a kind of pervasive theme. It's a theme of the prize as well. And the third is the environment. How do you balance energy objectives with environmental and uh, kind of, I'm going to think of it on shale gas. I'll talk about that a little bit. So first on basically uh, supply and demand. You know, sometimes I, I think with the prize, those who have read it, there are hundreds of characters in it, but sometimes I think there are only two characters who really matter. One is named supply and one is named demand. And uh, so you start by how have markets changed and how has the geography of the oil market changed? And we talk about globalization. Well, I think we can talk about the globalization of uh, energy demand, the shift that's going on. In the US, we actually have, you know, people talk about peak oil, peak demand. Our oil demand is going to go down because of demographics, because all of you are going to be driving more efficient cars, whether you want to or not, because it's regulated that you will do that. So we're going to have demand go down in the advanced countries. But there's a very big growth in the emerging markets. And to just so, show you how fast it's happening, 2,000, two-thirds of world oil demand in the developed world, one-third in the developing emerging markets. Two, that's 2000. 2010, even, and the emerging markets are going to rapidly move ahead. Uh, that's concentrated, that growth in China, India, the Middle East. But again, to kind of give you the sense of what the challenge is, we in the developed world use an average of 14 barrels of oil a year per capita. Developed world, that's 14, is three barrels a year. So what happens when these countries of a billion people or more go from three barrels to five barrels? It has a very big impact uh, on the markets. And that's what, I think that's what partly price is telling us all about, because price gives us information. And in terms of um, oil, like other commodities, is dominated by one big thing right now. Those of you who are in the real estate business or have uh, open you know, offices, you know, you go see the landlord and figure out what the build-out will be, where the walls will be, and the doors, and so forth. Well, we have the build-out of the whole country going on right now in terms of China. 20 million people a year moving from the countryside to the cities. So they need housing, they need jobs, they need transport. All of that takes energy. And uh, also, uh, more and more of them are buying cars. Just to give you one other comparison to me, the knockout comparison, 2,000, 17 million new cars sold in the United States, less than 2 million sold in China. That's 2,000. 2010, 17 million new cars by coincidence in China, 11 million in the United States. 
and people are talking about China being a 20 or 25 million car industry. Some of you may have noticed that uh, VW overtook Toyota as the world's largest automobile manufacturer. If you look at where the growth of their demand is and where they're selling their cars, it's because of their very strong position in China. So this leads to two questions. One, will there be conflict over supply, which I'll come back to, and can it be supplied, the, the energy? So I know that um, peak oil is a very fervent subject of discussion. It goes up and down. When pr markets are particularly t tight and prices are high, uh, people believe that uh, you know, it just has more, uh, it's more compelling. But I kind of approach it for two ways. One is a historical perspective. And I don't mean this facetiously. Uh, this is the fifth time we've run out of oil. The first time was in the 1880s when the head of Standard Oil of New Jersey, uh, or Standard Oil Trust, John D. Rockefeller's successor, said, I will drink every barrel of oil you find west of the Mississippi, because at that point, Pennsylvania was the Saudi Arabia of the day. Then came Texas and Oklahoma, and he kind of rethought that promise, and he said he let it go. But uh, then you had World War I, uh, Woodrow Wilson saying, I guess I'll have to walk to church on Sundays because we had gasoline-less Sundays because we were running out of oil. World War II, and then the thing that many of us remember vividly, the 1970s when we were going to fall off the oil mountain and oil production has really increased uh, dramatically. The other thing that is striking, uh, and it's the analytics side, our parent company, IHS, has the largest databases of oil and gas resources in the world. 87,000 fields, uh, uh, 1.4 million, no, 4.7 million oil wells. And you just look at the data, so we, don't, we just don't see that notion of a sharp peak. We see a plateau, we see big challenges, we see a lot of political risks and other kinds. Just don't see kind of, quote, running out. And it's because of what technology does, and it's what new areas do. And what we've seen in shale gas is a dramatic example of that. As I said, the biggest innovation of the last couple of decades, if you measure it in terms of uh, volume, 2% uh, of US gas production in 2000 now is about 30%. And it's still changing the economics of the whole energy field, changing the competitive uh, landscape. Uh, I, we had here in this room, we had the CEO of the, of the utility that has the largest nuclear fleet in the country. And he said, I wouldn't bet against cheap gas. It's changing that. It's bringing industries back, companies like Dow, that were not going to reinvest in the United States, but we're going to go to cheap gas elsewhere, now spending billions of dollars. And I think we'll see, because we're doing some work on it, you'll see that it's created a lot more jobs than most people uh, recognize. Now, it's also going to go global. Some countries have banned it, like France. Others, like Poland, really want it big discovery in Britain, and it also has an effect on the geopolitical balance. Well, that's on the gas side. I am um, actually fascinated by what's happening on the oil side right now. And in each case, it's technology that's opened the door to new resources and is redrawing the map of world oil in terms of supply. What do I mean? I mean, what's happening here in the Western Hemisphere? Uh, let's start uh, in the south, in Brazil. Brazil went into the ethanol business in the 1970s because it had no oil. It was never going to have oil. Well, now Brazil is a major offshore producer, and with these pre-salt discoveries, breakthroughs, Brazil, by t the end of this decade, could be producing twice as much oil as Venezuela, more than half as much as Saudi Arabia currently is, and that wasn't in you know, predictions before. So that's what's happening. To the north, uh, Canada, the oil sands, for years regarded as a fringe, will they be commercial? They are commercial. Million and a half barrels a day, more oil from oil sands than Libya was exporting before the Civil War. Big number, controversial in terms of the Keystone XL pipeline, but uh, a big source, and again, engineering advances. And then, what's happening here in the United States? The application of the technologies of shale gas to oil. You know, you don't, I don't think many of you thought of North Dakota as the oil patch. It's the fourth largest oil producing state in the country right now, lowest unemployment rate. And you can certainly see the impact here in Texas and in the Eagle Ford in South Texas. I was in Midland where these technologies are being applied. And you just feel, you know, that this is, this is happening. So you see what was thought to be the inexorable growth of U.S. 
imports isn't happening. Our imports are down, partly recession, partly efficiency, but partly new supply. U.S. oil production is up 10% since 2008. People don't recognize that. And the prospects of this continuing is very significant. And so it really does change the map. And again, it's technology responding to need. If oil was $20 a barrel, it wouldn't be happening. But this price level has uh, stimulated it. And uh, it's a kind of a huge impact. So the map is changing. What about security of supply? Well, I think that the traditional issues are there, disruptions, war. I think there's risk in terms of um, what the CEO of Sony called the bad new world of cyber vulnerability. And he used that phrase after Sony's website was attacked, costing the company about $170 million. And I know a lot of people are thinking about it. My concern is that we think about it enough and take the right actions so that it, we don't have a serious crisis involving cyber vulnerability to our electric grid or something like that, that we don't have to sit up a national commission afterwards to go back and look at it and say, how did we miss happening, this happening and we should have done the following things. Now, the energy security uh, issues, you know, clearly focus, Middle East is where many of them are centered. Uh, the Arab Spring really has upended the strategic balance. Uh, Egypt's role is very unclear, so a higher degree of uncertainty. Uh, we're sort of past the, the, the moment of Facebook, Twitter, Google as a kind of main determinants, and now it's really the struggle for power. Who's going to run the governments? Who's going to run the armies? Who's going to run the security services? And if they have oil, who's going to control the oil revenues? Those battles are, are going on in these countries. Uh, Turkey's role in the region uh, is uh, very interesting. It's become a much more assertive, uh, playing a role in trying to move into a vacuum. If you look at the risks there, I would say one big risk continues to be what started this, the Arab Spring, this youth bulge of young people who don't have jobs and opportunities. And that question of opportunities and jobs is still going to be there, and expectations have been raised, but Egypt was growing at 5%, now it's had a couple of uh, quarters of negative growth, so it's gonna be hard to meet expectations, so that will unfold. Uh, the second is a continuing question about terrorism, about Al-Qaeda, uh, and in particular focused on Yemen, which is, uh, by all measures, a failed state that happens to share an 1,100-mile border with Saudi Arabia and crucially uh, uh, placed in terms of, uh, of sea lanes. And the third issue, which kind of faded off, but is back, or will be back, is Iran and what its nuclear objectives are. I think the countries in the region, the other countries, have no doubt what Iran's objectives are. And at the very least, it could lead to a nuclear arms race uh, in the region. Uh, and you see the Saudi-Iranian competition that's going to intensify in Iraq. It's in Syria, it's in Bahrain, it's in Yemen. So that's in, kind of through the whole region. Uh, and then this bizarre plot to assassinate the Saudi ambassador, this Iranian plot in the restaurant, some of you may know, Cafe Milano in Georgetown in Washington. I mean, but it uh, kind of just added to the tension. So those security risks are there. The other set of security risks are around, uh, uh, or let's say geopolitical risks, around US-China and focused on the South China Sea primarily. Uh, where it's thought there are probably a lot of resources and a critical sea lane, and whether China is going to define it, stick to a definition of a core interest, which would be uh, alarming to the other countries uh, in the region. But it's a, you can see where, and people I find think that there's an inevitable confrontation between the US and China over energy. There are strategists in Washington and strategists in Beijing who say that. I don't think that's the case. I think. Um, China's own position is evolving very quickly, that it's not surprising that they want to be engaged and concerned about oil supplies, given uh, that their, their oil demand now is half of ours. By the end of the decade, it will probably be even with ours. I think we're seeing a lot of maturing and development of the Chinese oil companies. And I think for China and the United States, we're each other's most important relationship. So I think working on this to ensure that energy issues don't be inflammatory in their overall relationship is a kind of a critical on the agenda. Let me say kind of two things around the climate, uh, around the environment area. One, in terms of climate, I didn't want to kind of get in the argument, you know, 
uh, exactly on climate change and when two degrees increase in temperature. I wanted to answer another question, which is a kind of question that really interests me. Where did it come from? How did this kind of very abstract idea of climate, which was of interest just to a few scientists, become this dominating political issue, mega issue, certainly in Europe and on and off in the United States and other parts of the world? And I was going to write one chapter on this question, and I found it so interesting that I ended up writing six chapters on it, because it's a really great story. I found, that I, I found myself in the Alps in the 1770s, when a, a, a scientist, actually the man who apparently invented the word geologist, I say that to all the geologists in the audience, the Saussure, uh, kind of asked this question, how come we don't freeze at night and fry during the day? There's something up there called the atmosphere, he figured out. And then in the 1830s, a, another great scientist uh, came to this astonishing conclusion that before the present age, it had actually been an ice age. And so people started researching climate because they were afraid that the glaciers were gonna come back and obliterate civilization. And that went on kind of for about a, a century. And it was only in the 70s and 1970s and 80s that another one of these tenacious individuals uh, uh, it, uh, at Caltech and then at uh, the Scripps Institute started to measure carbon. And, and, and then it becomes very interesting about how scientific issue becomes engaged with the political process. Now the other environmental issue I want to talk about is the shale gas issue. And a lot of people are really interested in that. And I'm on this committee that was appointed by the Secretary of Energy uh, on shale gas, natural gas. And at the end of March, the President gave a speech, President Obama, in which he said that this is great, we have a 100-year supply, but it has to be environmentally, uh, produced in an environmentally sound way. You know, everyone in this room knows the emotion and intensity around uh, shale gas uh, issues and uh, movies made about it and everything like that. So we had to do the first phase of our report in August and the second in, uh, in November. And so our conclusions were, I hope, kind of pragmatic. It said that you know there are a series of issues that need to be engaged, that public trust needs to be reinforced because things don't go forward without public trust. Uh, and it's, it was so striking how, so as fast as shale gas developed, so this kind of opposition to it. So we identified 20 recommendations about best practices, about technology, about the need for measurement as opposed to anecdote uh, that addressed particularly the issues of produced water, uh, air quality and air pollution, and the, the third one is uh, community impact. And we said our view is if we address those uh, uh, in a sound, pragmatic way, then these questions can be met and this great resource can be developed. And so I think, I hope that the report, and there was some, uh, we, we talked to a lot of uh, people, companies here, learned from them what they, what they thought, uh, talked about regional centers of excellence, and if these things can be addressed, then we'll be able to move ahead. Uh, and I think it is obviously at the top of the agenda because it is such a great resource. So let me just kind of bring this picture together by saying, you know, how different will the future look? Well, we will use a lot more, we'll be a lot more efficient in using energy. Uh, when Bob Stovall and I did Energy Future, we talked about the U.S. becoming more energy efficient, and it was considered so bizarre coming from the Harvard Business School. That's why we ended up on the front page of the New York Times. I would say that since we did that book, Bob, the United States has become uh, really doubled its uh, energy efficiency and our projections were far too conservative in terms of what could be achieved. And I think we're gonna see probably another, we could, and this should be an objective, another doubling of energy efficiency. Problem with energy efficiency, and I quote the uh, former energy commissioner of the European Union, he said it's great, you actually get huge value from it, go to 54 mile per gallon cars as opposed to 30, think of what that means in volumes. He said the problem with it is there's no red ribbon to cut. There's no photo op for it. And I thought about that was the case until this week when the, I think the first commercial flight of the 787 Dreamliner, Boeing's plane has now taken off, and it's 20% more energy efficient, and I thought there's a great red ribbon to actually show what can be achieved. So I think it's part of the energy mix. Uh, renewables, I think, will, uh, will grow. It's interesting, renewables are both a big business and a small business. Uh, they're a big business in terms of actual dollars invested, small when you compare them to the overall energy mix. Uh, when I started the 
the book, the, ethanol was the, uh, the hot subject, biofuels. Uh, around 2008, it kind of flipped over to the electric car. And there's a great uh, picture in the book of uh, Thomas Edison, the most famous American of the day, having dinner in 1896 with a young engineer from the Detroit Edison Company named Henry Ford. And uh, Ford is explaining what he's going to do, and Edison, according to Ford, says, you know, that's a great idea, and I think that fuel you're going to use, that hydrocarbon, gasoline, hydrocarbon, is a great fuel. Ford says this, he gave him the confidence, he quit Detroit Edison, and out came the Model T. Well, now it's, uh, it's as, and then Edison changed his mind and tried to launch an electric car, but by 1910, the race was over, the Model T had won. A century later, we've opened it up again, the, the race has begun, and I would just say that it's uh, actually very early days, and it'll probably be about a half a decade before we know if it's beyond a, a niche or not. So, uh, we shouldn't forget in energy that things do take a long lead time, that uh, they need to be scaled to be competitive. Uh, and I think the, kind of the conclusion which shocks people that I come to uh, in the book in one way is based upon what we know today, and things can change, based upon what we know today, in 20 years probably our energy mix will be bigger, but it won't look too much different. Instead of 80% oil, natural gas, and coal, maybe we'll be somewhere in the 70 to 75 range. But it will be a, uh, it's only after that that we would start to see major changes. And, uh, and to be, get to scale, sources need to establish that they're, uh, that they're competitive, that they can stand on their own in terms of economics.